Good morning and welcome to worship at Fonder and Presbyterian Church. My name is Rob Lowry and I have the joy of being the pastor here at Fonder and welcoming you to worship with us this morning. A couple of notes about life at Fonder and right now. You'll notice behind me the construction going on in our sanctuary. This is renovations to our chancel area. They'll be going on through the month of September and into early October. We will be continuing to worship, however, despite the construction. Right now, we are worshiping outside due to the coronavirus numbers, and we hope you will join us at 11 a.m. on the front lawn for what we call the Chapel of the Trees. To learn more about life at Fondren, I invite you to stay tuned at the end of this worship service for some announcements or visit our website at www.fondrenpcusa.org. Now, friends, let's gather our hearts and our minds as together we prepare to worship God. Let us pray. With open arms you welcome all who call on your name, who acknowledge you as Lord and look to you in faith. No one stands outside the circle of your mercy and love, and so we come to offer you our worship, to declare that you are our God and that we are your people called and chosen by you from the very beginning. Through the presence of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see you here. Open our minds to receive your truth and our mouths to speak and sing your praise. For you alone are God, worthy of all praise and worship, now and to the end of time. Amen. Some boast of their cars, some of their mansions, but we boast of the name of the Lord of hosts. Should all else collapse in a heap, we shall stand up tall. 
Do not be impressed by the outward appearance of a person. For God does not see like we do, but looks into the heart. If anyone travels with Christ, there is a new creation. Old things are obsolete, all things become new. Friends, let us worship this God who looks into the human heart and through Christ Jesus makes all things new. Friends, because we know the newness in life that comes in Christ Jesus, we know the forgiveness that comes in Christ's love. Confident in God's forgiveness through Christ, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Let us pray. God of the rainbow, you made a covenant with all creatures promising life and hope. God of pathways, you show us how we should walk, yet we forget our connection with one another and think that we are the center of the universe. We wander from your paths of truth into paths of deceit and pride. Forgive us, God, and lead us back into the arms of your love. Amen. Friends, God is merciful and full of steadfast love. God will not forget us. God will not forsake us. God leads us in paths of God's steadfast love and God leads us in the way of God's faithfulness. Friends, believe this good news. In the faithfulness of God, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our text today is from the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis, from the 22nd chapter. It is the story of what is referred to often as the binding of Isaac or the sacrifice of Isaac. It begins a little earlier in the story with God's promise to Sarah, and then we pick up with Abraham on the mountain with his son. Listen now for the word of the Lord. The Lord was attentive to Sarah just as God had said, and the Lord carried out just what God had promised her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham when he was old, at the very time God had told him it would happen. Abraham named his son, the one Sarah bore, Isaac. Later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and God, Abraham answered, I'm here. God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, 
and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him up as an entirely burned offering there on one of the mountains that I will show you. Abraham got up early in the morning, harnessed his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, together with his son Isaac. He split the wood for the entirely burnt offering and set out and went to the place God had described to him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place at a distance. Abraham said to his servant, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will walk up there, worship, and then come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the entirely burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. He took the fire and the knife in his hand, and the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. Abraham said, I'm here, my son. Isaac said, here's the fire and here's the wood, but where is the lamb for the entirely burned offering? Abraham said, the lamb for the entirely burned offering, God will see to it, my son. The two of them walked on together. They arrived at the place God had described to him. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He tied up his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. But the Lord's messenger called out to Abraham from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham said, I'm here. The messenger said, don't stretch out your hand against the young man and don't do anything to him. I now know that you revere God and didn't hold back your son, your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a single ram caught by its horns in the dense underbrush. Abraham went over, took the ram, and offered it as an entirely burned offering instead of his son. Abraham named that place, the Lord Sees. That is the reason people today say, on this mountain, the Lord is seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <sighs> Friends, there is no safe way out of this text for us. This text provides traps and perils in every direction, and there is no way any of us are getting out of it unscathed. Now that I have your attention, this really is an appalling text, isn't it? As Duke Old Testament professor Ellen Davis rightly puts it, Abraham and God are both appalling in this text. Neither comes out of this scene unscathed, and the only way to get either of them out unscathed is to treat the text dishonestly. This really is an appalling text. Tradition calls this text the binding of Isaac or the sacrifice of Isaac or the test of Abraham's faith. This text runs counter, though, to so much of the story of the God of creation. But I'll be honest with you, the trouble I'm having with this text today hasn't always been the case for the church. In fact, Christians have really not had much of a problem with this text until fairly recently. For centuries, the story was just accepted at face value. God is testing Abraham, testing his faith in the most profoundly difficult way that test can be given. The child of his old age, the child of God's promise to Abraham and Sarah must be sacrificed to the very God who gave him in the first place. The fact the story was more than accepted 
through most of the church's history, it was celebrated. Abraham was celebrated as the great patriarch of the faith because of this very text. He almost sacrificed his own son. What wonderful faith the church for centuries said Abraham had. One of the, I think, more fascinating ways to trace how the community of faith at large understands and interprets a particular biblical story is to follow its representation in art. Although at various times in the church's history, art and theology stood at odds with one another, the artist's brush and the theologian's pen often reflect similar interpretations of the great stories of the faith. Because both were shaped in many ways by their moment in history and their community's moment in history. Up through the age of the Renaissance, this story was, in art and in theology, accepted as the story of brave Abraham trusting in God by blindly following God's command to sacrifice his own child. Abraham might be saddened by the command, mind you, but he's no less fervent in his willingness to sacrifice his own child, to carry out God's bloody command to offer Isaac as an entirely burned offering. But of course, the text gives us a handy escape hatch, doesn't it? The arrival, just in the nick of time, of the angel of the Lord to stay Abraham's hand. God, satisfied with Abraham's faith, sends the angel who stops him from sacrificing the boy and then provides the ram for sacrifice. A cursory tour of the art of the Renaissance when biblical themes were captured on a grand scale, depicts the image of Father Abraham preparing to sacrifice son Isaac with the angel's nick of time appearance, making the scene a little less troubling and a little easier to swallow. Still, in almost every one of those paintings, Abraham is depicted with the dagger in his hand, ready to strike a look of determination on his face. And if not determination, at least resignation of what must happen. In the work of Andrea del Sarto, Gershino, Titian, Albertinelli, perhaps the most honest depiction of all, Caravaggio's, who at least shows the terror on poor Isaac's face as he realizes what's about to happen. In all of them, Abraham is obviously resigned to what God has commanded and he is more than willing to sacrifice his son. Even up into the 19th century, the great French painter Jean Flandrin depicts an aggressively willing Abraham being stopped by the angel whose motion underscores his arrival just in time. For generations, that just-in-time arrival of the angel has been the hook on which the church has hung its hat and allowed us to see this troubling text as the story of a father's faithfulness rather than the morally questionable story of divine bloodlust that it really is. You see, angel or not, this text is just plain wrong. There's no honest reading of this text that leaves us untroubled, or at least there shouldn't be a reading that leaves us untroubled. 
It took quite a while for the church to be able to acknowledge that troubling aspect of this text. The 20th century, in fact, is when we began to see a dramatic shift in the way the church understood biblical texts like these. To be sure, many Christians are still more than willing to contort their perspective and the text to let the text off the hook. But a growing portion of the church has begun to follow the line of thought Ellen Davis suggests. Let's call appalling what is appalling. And this text is appalling. If no text is, this one certainly is. Whether the angel arrived in the nick of time to stay Abraham's hand or not, the reality of this text is that God ordered the sacrifice of a child. A child. Throughout Scripture, the text is unrelenting in its condemnation of the ancient practice of child sacrifice. Yet here, the God of heaven and earth, the God of creation and promise, the God of Noah's salvation and Sarah's miracle is ordering the very thing God miraculously provided be sacrificed. There's no way to contort this text to make it be okay. It just isn't. This text is not okay. And perhaps that's the point. Perhaps that's the point of this text for us. Not very helpful, is it? I know. We go to Scripture for answers to be encouraged and to feel better about things. And here I am saying that this text, this biblical text, is upsetting and unsettling because that's just what it is. Yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. This text is not one that leaves us undisturbed because this is a disturbing text. This is a disturbing text and it's right that we are troubled by it. One of my favorite pieces of art actually has this text as its subject. Russian Jewish artist Mark Chagall frequently used biblical imagery in his paintings, and the sacrifice of Isaac is one of his most well-known pieces. Since the first time I saw it, I was drawn into Chagall's depiction because it represents on canvas what I think this story does in so many of our spirits. It's disturbing, troubling, even kind of unfinished. Unlike his Renaissance and Romantic predecessor, Chagall does not try to make sense of the story, nor does he try to paint away the disturbing truth of it. In Chagall's depiction, Abraham appearing bewildered and confused, holds his son's body gently as if protecting it rather than harshly as if holding him still for sacrifice. Isaac stares off into the distance to some unknown point, his body limp and in places almost transparent as if he's already disappearing from the story. To the left of the canvas, behind a tree, a weeping woman who your heart knows is Sarah, recognizing what is happening to her miracle on that mountainside. And above, in the clouds, over the wings of the angels, depicted in stark outline, Christ carrying the cross, an old Jewish man, his head bowed low. A woman in the background running from danger unknown. 
Chagall takes what is a bewildering story of violence and trouble that makes no real sense and he leans into it. It is a chaotic and and troubling depiction of a chaotic and troubling text. Chagall's painting is profoundly honest in the way it visualizes the story the text tells. So what are we supposed to do with it? What do we do with this text? Are we supposed to just let it hang out there in this troubling way like some sword of Damocles or dagger of Abraham hanging over our heads ready to fall at any moment? Yes, that's exactly what we're supposed to do, I think. You see, there's not an easy way out of this text and to say there is would be dishonest. But easy isn't always an option in faith, is it? Learning to wrestle with this text in our faith the way Chagall wrestled with it on canvas, showing Abraham wrestling with God's command reminds us that Sometimes being in relationship with God is chaotic. It's difficult. It's troubling. Sometimes it even hurts like hell. To the path of faith, friends, is rarely smooth. Almost never easy. And never, if ever at all, free from peril. It wasn't for Abraham. It certainly isn't for us. You see, friends, to follow God, to follow our Christ, is a bewildering and dangerous endeavor in this life. Because before it can lead us to the empty tomb, we too first have to walk the rocky slopes of Calvary. We have to walk Calvary's steep slopes to the cross, to our place of testing, our place of bewilderment and confusion before we can find our way to the promise of the empty tomb. Such, friends, is the paradox of our faith. Such is the bewildering truth of our faith in Christ. Perhaps there is no easy way out of this story. Because like Abraham, we all find ourselves on that bewildering mountainside from time to time. But just as this one story is not the whole of God's witness born to us in Scripture, so, friends, those moments are not the sum total of the life of faith we share in Christ. The life of faith is strewn with obstacles. But thank God, thank Abraham's God and Isaac's God, thank our God that we do not walk it alone. Amen.
Friends, the meal of Christ is the feast for the people of God. Though we are not gathered in person in this place, we are still gathered around one table. Because wherever Christ's meal is served, it is Christ's table where we gather. With Christ's promise before us and God's promise within us, let us come to the table so we may taste and see that the Lord is indeed good. Let us pray. Holy God, you alone are holy. You alone are God. The universe declares your praise beyond the stars, beneath the sea, within each creature, with every breath. We praise you, O God. Generations bless your faithfulness through the water, by night and day, across the wilderness, out of exile, into the future. We bless you, O God. We give you thanks for your dear Son at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer, beside the sinner, among the poor, with us now. We thank you, O God. We give you thanks that your son on the night when he was betrayed gathered at table with his friends. Giving thanks to you, he took a loaf of bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, take, eat, do this remembering me. In the same way, he took a cup and pouring it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Pour it out in my blood, drink it all of you. Do this remembering me. Remembering his love for us on the way, at the table and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We pray for the gift of your spirit in our gathering within this meal, among your people throughout the world. Blessing, praise, and thanks to you, holy God, through Jesus Christ, by your spirit, in your church, without end. Amen. Friends, the word has been proclaimed, our prayers have been said, the meal has been shared, and it is time now that we go into God's work and world. Friends, may the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the everlasting companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us and keep us in this and in every day. And in one voice, may God's children in all times and places say, Amen.